Good morning, HVAC team. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, Unit 13, which is about compressors. Uh, where is it? There it is. Let's get into it. So the objectives are <clears throat> identify the major types of compressors, explain how each type of compressor works, give examples of um, applications for each type of compressor, explain horsepower and compressor capacity, explain common compressor problems. Um, the compressor is a mechanical device for pumping refrigerant vapor from the low pressure side of the evaporator to the high pressure side in the condenser. Uh, the compressor reduces the volume of the refrigerant gas by squeezing it. So that's, you know, basically what it does, you know, it squeezes it and, uh, and you know, and it creates that um, higher pressure. Uh, one thing to note is that it says pumping refrigerant vapor from low side to high side. Refrigerant vapor being the key term. So uh, compressors are vapor pumps, not liquid pumps. Compressors and liquid do not mix. You will break your compressor if you allow liquid to go to it, which is why it's so important to make sure that the correct refrigerant charge is applied in a refrigeration system. So positive displacement compressors. Positive displacement compressors move the gas by taking it into a space and then replacing that space with something physical like a piston. So as that piston go, you got refrigerant in a cylinder and then that piston goes into that same, uh, same cylinder and it's taking up the space that once was, was there and now it is not and it's putting pressure on the refrigerant. Uh, basically, whatever is in the space is positively shoved out by the mechanism being the piston. Uh, closing off or blocking the discharge valve on a, comp on a positive displacement compressor uh, while it is operating can be dangerous. With no place to go, the discharge pressure increases rapidly, creating extremely high pressures that can cause compressor damage because the gas must go somewhere. Excuse me a second. So, uh, non-positive displacement compressors. These machines operate like giant fans or turbines turning at very high speeds. They basically throw the refrigerant outward, uh, creating an increase in pressure uh, and temperature. Uh, so that's like the centrifugal compressors. Uh, they, they have these impellers that spin, the refrigerant comes in the middle, and as it spins, it throws it to the outside. It's like the Gravitron. I don't know if anybody, uh, you know, has been on the Gravitron at like a theme park. I mean, not a theme park, but like at a, a carnival. And you go in there, you stand up against the wall. And then as it spins, you get like sucked up against the wall. That's what's happening to the refrigerant. So imagine if you were refrigerant and you're sucked up against the wall. And then as soon as you spin around, there's a discharge line right there that's just throws you right out of the damn rabbit trap. That's kind of what's happening to the refrigerant inside of a centrifugal compressor. It, it you know, it, it uses that um, centrifugal force and throws the refrigerant out at a much higher uh, pressure through the uh, discharge line. Uh, this compressor, uh, uh, these compressors are called centrifugal compressors after the physical force <clears throat> that makes them work. Uh, the discharge of a centrifugal compressor should not be blocked because it can um, because it can set up a condition known as surging, which can damage the compressor. Hermetic compressor shells. Operating a hermetic compressor on a low charge can uh, can cause the motor to overheat because poor motor cooling. The motor varnishes uh, used in the motor winding lose some of their insulating ability under deep vacuums. A motors, uh, sorry, motors can arc, um, they can arc out very quickly even before they have time to overheat. So keeping the refrigerant clean is especially important in a system with a hermetic compressor because the refrigerant and oil flow directly over the motor and all internal electrical components. 
cooling semi-hermetic compressors. Air-cooled semi-hermetic compressors are used, uh, sorry, use airflow over the motor portion of the compressor to cool the compressor motor. The refrigerant goes straight into the cylinder on these compressors, uh, maintaining a minimum superheat of 20 degrees Fahrenheit at the compressor is critical uh, for, for air-cooled semi-hermetic compressors. They can operate safely at much lower superheat because the refrigerant goes over the most, uh, sorry, goes over the motor first before entering the cylinder. Let me go back really quick. I just wanted to reiterate something here. Wait, is it on this one? Yeah, so um, on the hermetic compressors, <clears throat> that's another um, reason why the refrigerant is so, um, the refrigerant level is important because you want to make sure that um, that your uh, your your system isn't starved because that refrigerant that's coming back to the compressor it serves another purpose. It it also it's also used to cool the compressor. So that's just like another function of the uh, suction gas as it goes in. So that was just something I kind of wanted to just reiterate um, because that's more common. Well, it depends on what um, what you end up doing in the field, but most, a lot of the systems use uh, hermetic compressors, residential, commercial, light commercial stuff, mostly have hermetic compressors and, uh, and that's the type of cooling that they, um, that they typically use as far as keeping the, uh, the compressor from overheating, it's the suction gas. Um, the semi-hermetic compressors are more so like commercial stuff, industrial stuff, um, which, you know, you'll also run into out there. Um, so moving on, rotary compressor operational characteristics. Rotary, compre rotary compressors are constructed of precisely uh, machined metal parts with no gaskets or, uh, or rings. So clean system and proper lubrication is critical. Um, long refrigerant lines can cause problems with rotary compressors because they can lose their oil in the lines and, and, uh, and seas. Um, so it's you know the longer the line, the more <clears throat> the more likely that you can uh, not have proper lubrication at the compressor. Um, small impurities can can cause can also cause them to seize. So keeping condensers clean is especially important with rotary compressors because they are cooled by the discharge gas. Dirty condensers lead uh, lead to overheated compressors. So that's another reason why condenser cleaning is so important. People kind of undermine it, but the the condensers need to be clean because if they're if they're not, if they're all gunked up and, and packed full of dust and dirt and debris, uh, the airflow across it will be extremely poor. And then that airflow is supposed to be used to cool that refrigerant. And if that doesn't happen, then you're going to overheat your compressor. Uh, scroll compressor precautions. Do not allow the suction pressure to drop below 25 PSI during charging or below 7 PSI for even, uh, for even a few seconds. Low pressures can overheat the, scroll compress the scrolls and damage the compressor. Scroll compressors are directional. They only work in one direction. Uh, check for proper rotation when starting systems with three-phase scroll compressors. So basically, <clears throat> if you hook your gauges up to a system when you start it up, um, your high side pressure should be higher <laughs> than the low side pressure. Um, if you're getting the opposite, if you're getting high side pressures on the low side and, uh, and then, you know, lower pressures on the high side, that's an indication that your compressor's running backwards. And then also you'll hear it, it'll sound crazy. Your compressor's gonna make this loud sound and uh, that's also going to let you know if that happens on a three-phase system. <clears throat> all you got to do is switch any two of the three legs. So you open up the disconnect, you know, you kill the power to it, and then there's be three wires in there. You just disconnect one wire, disconnect a second wire, and then reconnect them, 
in the uh, opposite positions. So put number one in number two's position and put number two in number one's position or either any of the three. It doesn't matter as long as you switch two of them and it'll reverse the polarity and correct your issue. Uh, so yeah, so this can be done um, with gauge manifolds. <laughs> if normal suction and discharge pressures are seen soon after startup, the rotation is correct. If not, um, if they do not quickly, quickly develop, shut off the machine and reverse to compressor power leads. So yeah, pretty much what I was just saying. So two-step scroll compressors. The two-step scroll works by activating an internal solenoid, which changes the compressor's capacity from 67% to 100% instantly. Um, the two-step scroll was designed for energy saving purposes. Uh, the compressor only runs to the capacity needed. If, uh, it either loads up full capacity or unloads to lower capacity. And that's just based on the load on the system. Digital scroll compressor. Digital scroll compressors get their name from the fact that they, uh, they only operate under two conditions. They either operate at 100% capacity or 0% capacity. Um, it is the ability to switch very quickly between full on capacity and full off capacity that allows digital scrolls to produce an infinite range of capacity. Screw compressors, these are the big boys. These are like the ones on those uh, uh, ammonia systems, industrial refrigeration. Uh, rotary screw compressors are positive displacement machines made for large tonnage applications. Rotary screw compressors are available in single, twin, and triple rotor types. Compressor capacity and horsepower. A compressor's capacity is not a fixed value. Uh, there are many factors that affect the that affect the compressor's BTUs per hour uh, capacity per horsepower of input. These factors include evaporator temperature, condenser temperature, refrigerate, refrigerant properties, and compressor um, RPM. So you can you can change the capacity of your system without realizing it just with poor maintenance. So um, you know again the evap coils and condenser coils and filters all need to be cleaned and changed regularly and um, and your refrigerant level needs to be correct or, or you could lose capacity uh, of your system you know just because of those maintenance issues and then also insulation is a big deal too uh, if your section line is not insulated that will affect your capacity as well because the low side absorbs heat and if your suction line is running along the roof out in the sun and it ain't uh, insulated, it's gonna be absorbing the heat in the sun from the sun as well. So you, you only want it to absorb heat in the evap coil. The rest of the line needs to be insulated. So anyway, low evaporator temperatures. Less refrigerant enters the cylinder for each compression cycle at lower evaporator temperatures. Less cooling occurs when less refrigerant flows through the system. This requires more horsepower for each BTU of cooling. Low condenser temperatures. The cooling, or sorry, the cooler the air or water entering the condenser, the greater its heat removal capacity. This results in, uh, in lower condenser pressures and the compressor has to do less work. Uh, this reduces the horsepower required for each BTU of cooling. So again, the outside air is what's cooling the refrigerant in the condenser. So the cooler the outside air, the easier it is to condense that vapor back into a liquid. Compressor don't have to work too hard to do its job. And you know that you're sending, uh, you have a better chance of making sure you're sending 100% liquid refrigerant to your uh, metering device. So high condenser temperatures. The higher the condenser temperature, the harder a compressor has to work to move the refrigerant uh, vapor out of the evaporator into the compressor. This requires more horsepower for each BTU. Air conditioners in the Southwest states experience the high summer desert temperatures and rooftop um, air conditioners may experience similar temperatures through much of the United States. 
Rule of thumb, air conditioning temperatures equal one horsepower per ton of cooling. Medium temp refrigeration equals one horsepower per two thirds of a ton of cooling. And low temp refrigeration equals one horsepower per one third of a ton of cooling. Um, when you buy a hermetic compressor, you are buying both a motor and a compressor. <clears throat> Uh, the size and type of motor that you need will change depending upon what you are asking the compressor to do. Basically, uh, you know, the application. Are we trying to cool a two-bedroom apartment or are we trying to cool a warehouse full of produce? Uh, never use a compressor for an application for which it is not intended to be used. Sometimes people get the idea that having an oversized system is good. Oh, it's going really cool, but you're gonna you're gonna ruin that that compressor. <clears throat> um, capacity control. Compressor capacity control refers to controlling how much work the compressor can perform. The idea of capacity control is to make the compressor capacity match the load. Capacity control is uh, or capacity control also improves building comfort. The energy required to operate the compressor is minimized by matching the compressor capacity to the load because an unloaded compressor uses less power than a fully loaded compressor. A compressor that runs continuously at reduced capacity will draw fewer total watts um, of power than one that starts and stops while running at full capacity. Cylinder unloading. Cylinder unloading is available on reciprocating compressors with multiple heads. Um, they can unload one or more cylinders by holding the suction valves open, bypassing the cylinder discharge to the suction manifold or blocking the suction inlet. Uh, depending on the compressor, multiple stages of control can be provided and, uh, and power saving achieved. The number of uh, steps depends upon the number of heads. A three head compressor can have up to 33%, 66%, and 100%. Oil slugging. <clears throat> Oil slugging does the same type of damage that liquid refrigerant slugging does. Uh, it is caused by a sudden return of large amounts of refrigerant oil. Um, this usually indicates a refrigerant piping problem or a system issue. Suction lines with large traps can fill with oil and then send back in one burst. So basically overloading your compressor with oil, like sending all the oil back to the compressor all at once in a large quantity can slug the compressor to have the same reaction as having liquid refrigerant going to your compressor. You could break the valves and uh, you know ruin the compressor. Um, flooded starts. Refrigerant dissolves in oil during the off cycle. When the compressor starts, the refrigerant boils out <coughs> violently, uh, creating a foamy refrigerant oil mixture. This foam can fill the crankcase and make it make its way into the cylinder. Enough foam in the cylinder will cause hydraulic pressure and break parts. So again, it's you know like having liquid in the compressor. Off cycle migration can be minimized with crankcase heaters and pump down cycles. So the crankcase heater is a little electric heater around the crankcase where the oil collects in the, uh, in the, in the compressor. The whole point of the crankcase heater is to, is to keep the, the refrigerant vapor that's in the uh, compressor, keep it in the vapor form because if that liquid if that refrigerant condenses into a liquid because the compressor is off, so it's not, you know, so it's cooled off, that whatever vapor is left in there, if it condenses to a liquid <clears throat> while the compressor is off, it ain't really bothering nothing. But as soon as you cut that compressor off, boom, liquid in the parts, you could damage your compressor. Crankcase heater is there to boil that refrigerant, keep the keep liquid refrigerant from becoming present in the oil during the off cycle. 
leaking valves. A reciprocating compressor with leaking valves cannot maintain the desired pressure difference. Um, a high suction pressure and low discharge pressure are the most common symptoms. Um, the amp draw is low because the compressor is doing less work. The system superheat is high and the system subcooling is low. Um, just a quick tip about the amps. Um, it says the amp draw is low because the compressor is doing less work. So low amps is, is okay. Uh, there's no such thing as under amping. Um, you know, if, if you don't remember from my 130, um, when you check the amps on something, there's going to be the rated amps on the data tag, and that's basically the maximum. If your compressor is pulling, let's say nine is the maximum. If it's pulling nine or below, it's good. If it's pulling four, that's good. That means it don't have to work that hard to do its job. If it's pulling something above nine, now we have a problem. It's working too hard for whatever reason, whether it's just an old compressor just nearing the end of its life, or it's a, a you know a system that's got maintenance issues and it's making the compressor work too hard, or refrigerant charge issues. So. Um, so yeah, so checking the amps is, is, is the way you check the health of a motor. And low amps is a good thing. Uh, worn wrist pins, rods, and bearings. So these are like your, these are your internal parts on your compressor that you don't want breaking. Systems that have leaking discharge valves or blown head gaskets will eventually develop problems in their piston, ring, uh, in their piston wrist pins and rods. When a compressor with this problem starts, it is a it is very noisy until the head pressure builds up. So that's a indication. Um, it's a specific sound. The more experience that you have, you'll 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 be able to notice when compressors sound right and when they don't sound right. Uh, motor loading. When the compressor is not performing satisfactorily, the motor load sometimes provides a clue. To the trouble, either an exponentially high or exceptionally low motor load is an indication of improper operation. So, in summary, compressors are vapor pumps, absolutely not liquid pumps. The compressor's job is to raise the pressure and temperature of the refrigerant so that it can be condensed. Because again, we're using the outside air to condense that, to cool that refrigerant, condense it back to a liquid. So if that outside air is like 80 degrees, we need to raise the temperature and pressure of the refrigerant in that condenser so it can be at least 20, 30 degrees hotter than the outside air so that the outside air can cool it and condense it. Um, the different compressor mechanical designs include reciprocating, rotary, scroll, screw, and centripetal. Um, so that is it for Unit 13. Hope that was helpful. Read your book to get more info. Um, and uh, I will catch y'all on the next one.